SciBite is produced by JupiterBroadcasting.com, independent entertainment that's on demand and always thoughtful. Check us out. everyone you're listening to jupiter broadcasting science podcast we recorded this one on january 4th and uh we let it out onto the world on january 5th 2012 my name is chris and joining me like every single week is heather hello there chris hey there heather welcome back to science welcome back to science we should apologize we are one day late there was some complications but we're here yep 2000, we're back. 2012 started a little bumpy but we're, we're prepared for it right yeah. we can handle whatever it's going to throw at us we're so armed, far. We're armed with science. Exactly. Science is our ally. Do you want to tell people what we have coming up on today's show? Sure. To, today we're going to take a look at some new satellites orbiting the moon, bug, bugged bugs, unicycles, <laughs> a comet that's going to, that has actually survived a brush with the sun, the 15 minutes of science fame problem, another update on poor Phobos Grunt, and as always, take a peek back into history and up in the sky. I am excited to talk about all of that stuff. The bugged bug story, uh, it's, I'll be honest, it's going to make my skin crawl just a little bit, but I think yeah. people are going to love it. It's, it's one of those stories that it's uh, like one of those things from Get Smart or uh, Mission Impossible actually coming real. So yeah. uh, we'll talk about those. Now, uh, one thing I want to give a mention to before we get rolling here is uh, the Jupiter signal is coming back. Yeah. And uh, we have some exciting announcements we'll be making. I don't know what exactly announcements we're ready to make, but one of them could potentially involve Heather and I and future shows. So uh, the uh, best way to get that would be to go over to the SciBite show notes, but also you can go to bit.ly slash Jupiter Signal. And uh, it's back for our second edition I'm excited about. Yes. Hey, uh, we've, got, we've got a ton of different news we could cover. I mean... I don't know where to start. I think maybe the best place to start would be with the uh, with the moon orbiter story. Yes. So uh, if you're not if you're not uh, objecting to anything, let's jump right into the news. All right, Heather, what's our first news story today? All right, so the moon has some new, well, little artificial moons. They moon the Grail satellites, Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory. They do love those acronyms. Yeah, well, that's a good one, too. Yep, it, it's not too bad. So these launched back in September of 2011, so not that long ago, but not like the lunar, lunar people who got there in just a couple of days. Um, these just took their time because they're wanting to stay in a nice, um, nice orbit. Hmm. So it's two practically identical st- spacecraft, yeah, about like the size of a twins. washing machine. Yeah, yeah, this is really cool. Yeah. And they're going to orbit, um, there's two of them, in a circumpolar orbit. So they're, one will lead and one will follow. And that's pretty much the only difference that there is between the two of them, hmm. is because one has to lead and one has to follow. So are they doing like, uh, uh, like kind of like they're doing with the ones that are orbiting the sun right now, where they're taking different sides of the moon at the same time kind of a thing? No. Well, the sun is a, is a constantly changing thing. So that's right, where, why right. we want eyes on that. The moon doesn't really change all that much. I mean, you get you know, little meteorite hits here and there. What this one is doing is it's measuring the gravitational pull on these satellites. Oh, interesting. Okay. So what they're able to do is they've got, once they're in place, which will take uh, over the next few months, um, for them to get down to an orbit of only 34 miles off the surface of the moon. Huh. Now that, that, that... Uh, by itself is not all of that remarkable, except for I'm remembering back to some information I heard about the uh, Apollo 11 mission. And mm-hmm. I seem to recall, I might have my numbers a little wrong here, but I seem to recall that um, when, the, when, the reconnaissance, when the module that stayed up orbiting the moon after uh, Buzz and, and uh, Neil. Uh, Neil went down to the planet, or the moon, mm-hmm. uh, there was, a, of course, the spacecraft that remained in orbit they had to re- rendezvous with. And I, I seem to recall that one stayed at like a distance of like 3,000 miles or something like that, because they yeah. just didn't know what to expect in terms of gravity. So when you tell me this one's orbiting at 30 miles, it's yeah. a pretty significant difference. Yeah, I mean, it's right now, they're, an orbit takes about 11 and a half hours. It's going to get down to just two hours. Wow. wow. Because so, they're orbiting so low. And this is probably just what? Because they need to uh, be able to 
carefully detect the different gravi- gravitational fluctuations and they just have to get closer to do it? Yeah, you want to be close so that you can have, so that it's, if the higher it is, the more broad, think of a, a cone. The spacecraft is the tip of the cone. So the closer in, the smaller the, the end of the cone is. So it's a small area that you're measuring. If you pull it way far away, then it's a much larger area that's affecting your satellite. Oh, sure. so you want it as close as you can get away with. And where we get in with being able to measure this very precisely is that these two satellites talk to each other. And you can actually tell how far apart they are within a few microns. <laughs> wow. That's, with, that's like the width of a hair. You know, it, it also, it, now I, I realize that it's just the, uh, the state of, you know, the information they had to work with. But do, don't you find it kind of funny that uh, we've had so many Apollo visits to Apollo missions to the moon and we don't have a good understanding of its gravity and the idea that we launched and landed on this planet, that, or this moon that has different levels of fluctuating gravity all over its surface. I mean, that seems pretty, pretty surprising to me. Like, it's a pretty big risk. Well, it all comes down to what it is, is we don't really know all that much about the interior of the moon. I mean, the Earth has... I believe. Cheese, actually. Uh, Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, (laughs) Limburger, obviously. Um, (laughs) But beyond that... Well, different kinds of cheese, you know, here and there. Yeah, it So you have to measure it very precisely to figure out what part is what. I think everybody knows that the uh, North and South Poles generally aren't that tasty, but the good stuff's in the middle of the moon. Yeah. yeah. You have to kind of dig down a little and then it's great. Yeah, yeah. Great for chips. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But we, I know we've covered on some SciBite before, maybe been a while back, that, you know, Earth has little bits and pieces that are different gravity and it's because there's a big chunk of, um, you know, rock here or thinned crust here but for the moon we really haven't had that much um really scientific analysis being able to kind of look inside the moon and figure out what's in there okay and and by studying the gravity fields they get an idea of what's underneath the surface yeah so you'll be able to see how they act and you know you'll be able to see a little gravity fluctuation here and you then we'll be able to check the what we see visually and say yeah there's a big crater there Yes, there's a little mountain there, but where those things don't line up, you know, where there's additional fluctuations, then we can kind of get an I- a better idea of where the core of the moon is. All ah, right. To, to, to identify the areas of interest, perhaps. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, and the moon itself, I mean, we have some major questions about the moon that we don't really know. There is, you know, the near side of the moon and the far side of the moon because it's locked into orbit. So we always see the same side. The side we see has these big, um, you know, impact basins where, you know, the man and the moon. Right. You know, where it's just lots of gray, where essentially what happened is some big impacts happened and mag- magma came out and flooded all these big areas. Oh, so yeah. Big, huge, like, smooth areas in the moon. The backside doesn't have that. There are just a couple very small ones. It's just littered with impacts. And we're not entirely sure why that is. You know, why one side would be, have a lot of magma and one side would not. We've talked about this before. Do you subscribe to the uh, theory that the moon is r- ripped chunks away from Earth? I, I know we talked about it on the show, but I can't remember if you bought into that theory. I do. There is, um, I mean, scientifically looking at it, there is some evidence for that to happen. Um, you know, we have a lot more metals and things like that on the surface than one might expect. You know, well, I agree. There's definitely evidence that suggests that, you know, the Earth has been beaten and has brought up some of those oh, metals. Oh, yeah, we know that. Surface. Yeah, yeah. But weren't, wasn't, uh, I, haven't they also found elements in moon rock that they don't believe exist here on Earth or something like that? Is that not true? Is that just a rumor? Uh, they've seen, they've seen it both ways. I've seen pieces that are Earth and ten, I believe they have seen pieces that are not. But if there was, you know, this original, you know, slightly smaller than Mars object, you know, planet X that came in and smashed the earth, then there would still be pieces of planet X around. I mean, yeah, it, you know, it would fly up a chunk of the earth too, Mm -hmm. but there would be, you know, the mixture of these two planets. Yeah. It'd be a mix. Yeah. So it would make sense. There would be some non earthy parts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Cause there's all sorts of things have been smashed into that thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the things, too, did you mention that the sort of symbolic uh, fact that uh, they went into breaking firing mode on New Year's Day and New Year's Eve? So that's kind of neat, too. 
Yeah, they were quite busy. I don't think they did much holidaying except, <laughs> you know, the satellite yeah. enters and then they, yeah. then they, you know, they can't really pop of anything, you know, alcoholic bubbly because they got to watch their satellites. But, you know, they slice open their cake and they're like, woo. And if all the fireworks, everyone else is going. They're like, hey, you're celebrating our spacecraft too. Excellent. I like that there's a clip we have in the show notes and of the uh, of the probes getting launched up in space. And uh, what I like about it is it has the audio from the NASA control center and yeah. they still do the standing ovation thing yeah. uh, when something successful goes, which is just so awesome because there you know, are there are specific traditions that that some of them were started back in the Apollo era that still go on. I think there's one tradition about eating some sort of a nut some sort of nuts when something happens <laughs> and they'll still do that well i mean uh, it's it's a tradition that you know that you know something good happens and that you do this you know this is successful so you do that and I, it's just a tradition and who wants to break a tradition well and i kind of like it because it's it's celebrating what a monumental achievement anytime we do something in space like this because yeah it's still massive yeah and i mean think about it i mean this is a team of people who have been working on this for a really long time. These things go, they're in planning stages for a decade, generally, mm-hmm. at least before they, you know, before they're actually launched. It takes a while for them to get to plan. It takes a while for them to get approved. It takes a while for them to get built. You know, and these people will be, have been working on this for a while. This particular mission will have a data collection phase of about 82 days, starting in March. Okay, so you know, only 82 be, days, huh? Well, it could be extended another two months. The problem is that there's going to be a lunar eclipse in June, which means the, the moon will be blocked from the sun and these are solar powered. Oh. So if they survive the lack of power, then they could go on for another two months. I see. Huh. Seems like it'd be handy to have something over there all the time, running as long as possible. Yeah. Well, there have been um, lunar uh, photographic orbiters where they go and take uh, photographic images of the moon. And things like that. It's just nothing specific has really done this kind of data tr- that can really Uh-oh. get into the ideas of the interior of the moon. Well, speaking of uh, photos, is there any any that we know of any photographic equipment on these probes too? Are they going to be taking any high res images? There are. It is the Moon Cam Project. This is actually for middle school students. They applied four cameras on each spacecraft, and these middle school students can select targets on the moon for them to be photographed. And this is, uh, oh. this is a program started by Sally Ride, who was the first woman, uh, United, U.S. woman to go into space. Right. And she kind of did this. And it, it's an attempt to motivate kids into studying math and science and that kind of a thing. That's great. Any word on what they're going to take photos of? Uh, it's all up to the kids. So oh, I, I, I haven't get, seen the entire list yet. I hope they get photos of some of the Apollo landing sites. Yeah, my guess is that some middle school student is wanting to see that. Yeah, and they I want to see did, that. NASA is also really good. Well, they do a lot of it. They do naming contests. Oh. You know, name this little bit, you know, write in, you know, submit your idea for, sure. you know, the name for this little thing. And they, right now they're called, you know, Grail A and Grail B. But they'll have, you know, quote unquote, proper names that these students, that schools and students were able to submit names to. And they should be being announced any time now. They said it wouldn't be until after both of them were in orbit. Um, so sometime between now and March, I don't know. But at some point soon, they should have those posted. And the link to the page that they'll get posted is in the show notes. Oh, cool. I'd like to do a follow-up on that if something exciting happens. Yes. I love doing that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you got some other interesting notes here. Uh, yeah. Any, any other uh, territory you want to cover on this one? Um, well, we, like, uh, I did mention before that we have sort of gravity maps of the Earth. And that was mainly from the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, GRACE, which mapped the Earth gravity, or has been since 2002. And so this is kind of very similar to that. It's just mapping the moon. Okay. Okay. And uh, I'm trying to, you know me, Heather, I'm an optimist. And I'm trying to think of, I've heard like uh, China talk about establishing a uh, a moon base. and. uh, I don't know. I just don't know if I have a. I just don't have a ton of confidence that the U.S. is going to be the uh, the next nation to make a big presence on the moon. So, do you know? Is it is it traditional for NASA to share this information that they're collecting with the other nation communities, or is this sort of something that they might consider? Well, the U.S. citizens funded this, 
it's it's the U.S. government's research, and if they want to know something like this, they go do their own research. How did do you know how that works in these kind of situations? I know in a general degree, um, for most most of the stuff, the raw data is available. Okay, a great deal of the raw data is available. Now NASA might have to do you know a whole bunch of stuff to make it look nice, to smooth it out, to really make a lot of sense of it. Mm. You know, and then they'll release that data. And then as long as people, you know, say, hey, this is either way, as long as people say this is this is NASA stuff. I think there's a couple of larger, larger countries that have these sort of uh, space programs like you know, NASA, the ESA, um, you know, the Russians. I love uh, they all kind of share at least some information. I love that. I love that because, I mean, hopefully it's the U.S. that establishes some sort of uh, long term presence on the moon. But I don't know, you know, with our current economic status and. All of those things, it seems like it's a well, pie in the sky kind of thing. So I'd love to. Well, under the current administration, they, uh, the moon is not a priority. I believe the priorities are asteroid and Mars. Or a near Earth object. I do remember about the asteroid. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes sense not, too. You know, in the asteroid belt, but something that passes by to Earth. Sure. Sure. I guess that makes sense. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I want yeah. both. I want, I want, I want near Earth, I want near Earth objects and I want the moon. <laughs> <laughs> I want it all, right? Because yeah, I don't know. I just I'd, I'd go for uh for Mars and Moon. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Are you kidding me? Yeah. That, absolutely. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, any other thoughts on this story? Uh, no. There's just a lot of video. There's a Twitter for this, uh, so you can ke- keep the up on the latest of information on this. That's a whole actually bunch of... a great little feed to go check, even if you're not a Twitter user. You can just go there and follow the feed. Yep. Mm-hmm. Good pick. All right. <laughs> Well, that, uh, that little tone there means we're going to take a break here and uh, tell you about a way that you can support the fine productions over here at Jupiter Broadcasting. Uh, we don't have a uh, main sponsor this week, though uh, we have picked some Audible books in the past that we highly recommend. This week, if you happen to be as hooked as Heather and I playing Star Wars, or, or want to become as hooked as Heather and I, I should say, playing Star Wars Old Republic, I got two different options for you. Uh, number one is you can actually just go over to the show notes and pick up a copy of Star Wars Old Republic and... Uh, just a percentage of your purchase goes to Jupiter Broadcasting. There's another route you might consider taking too if you're already a Star Wars Zild Republic player. Uh, you, might, you might know that they don't offer like a lifetime or even like a yearly purchase, which is kind of funky. They just kind of have some strict um, subscription Six months is the longest. Right. And, you know, one of the nice things you can do is you can actually, and again, link in the show notes uh, and we get a percentage of the purchase, but I'll, I'll link a, a time card. And you can actually just uh, buy these time cards every three months and charge your account up. And it's a nice way not to put something on your credit card that you uh, don't want to auto renew. And yeah. uh, plus, and then it's also a nice way to send a percentage of your game time purchase, you know, to Jupiter Broadcasting. So we yeah, benefit it, from it, your tour obsession. Yeah, you get benefits. Jupiter Broadcasting gets <laughs> benefits. Everybody gets benefits. It's Everybody gaming with benefits. Wins. Who doesn't love gaming with benefits, right? That, no. It's like friends with benefits, you? but not quite as awesome. Yeah. Right. Right. And so uh, you do have to use the links in the show notes for us to get credit for either one of those. And also, you can, if you're an Audible fan, I'll have a new pick coming up soon. But uh, you can also check the show notes for uh, old ones. All right, Heather. With that out of the way. It's time for the SciBite News Bite. Now, we got a big News Bite section. It's almost more like a news mouthful. Wait. Hmm. Sure. I'm not sure how to say that. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, you know where I'm going. I mean, we've actually got some really interesting stuff in the news bite this week. Normally, yes. uh, I I would say uh, the news bite is maybe a little quicker stories, but this first one I think is going to have people's interest peaked pretty pretty high. At least I got mine yeah. going, and that is bugged bugs. What are we talking about yes. here? This is new technology that is being designed to use the kinetic energy of like the wings of bugs to power things like mini cameras or microphones. That's gross. <laughs> yeah, there's only so many pictures I used for this. Yeah, I know. Uh, you do have some great pictures. I'll give you that. But uh, this is this is nasty. This is like um, this is like a get smart kind of thing where they put a microphone on a fake bug, but only they're actually see where where sci- real science is actually more fascinating because they're talking about using live bug. Yeah, and they they've had some success already. They've been able to mount um, oh great some stuff on a little green June bug that can that'll. That harnesses the kinetic energy from its little wings. That's really interesting. So, Anyways. yeah, like hmm. like the chat room says, bugs are kind of creepy, and like you've said, but this is really interesting because they have you know the micro air vehicles 
you know, the little completely electronic ones. But when they get small, they're limited by weight and volume for power supply. Ah. And these kind of things, if you can harness that energy, then as long as you're not using any more than that, then you're only limited by the bug's lifespan. Right. Boy, geez. Uh, and as technology gets more sophisticated and compact, you're going to be able to put better and better things on there. I mean, like, yeah. I don't know if you were joking when you put it in the show notes, but uh, you could really put like a, a microphone or, mm-hmm. I mean, maybe not a camera. I don't know. Maybe like a low res cell phone type camera or something. Yeah. Something, something low res fisheye. Yeah. Okay. You know, something very vague, of course, at first. Uh, but this is, this is what they're, they're thinking is they're kind of working in that direction. The thought of some of this is that, you know, in a disaster zone, you'll have, you know, crumpled buildings. You have people trying to look, you have search animals trying to look, but there are some places that are just too tiny and kind of dangerous when things are not settled yet. And what if you had like a box of these bugs that you kind of, you know, get into a building and they fly around and do their thing and you say, hey, we picked up sound over here and we picked up sound over there and we saw movement over there. Let's go to those places. I'll I'll be honest with you. My first thought, my first reaction wasn't about the humanitarian things you could do. Like you, you nail, you're nailing it there. I mean that, you know, be able to fly into a, you know, a, a rubble or something like that or crawl as a bug would be able to do yeah. um, is, is, is incredibly useful. I yeah. of course was going more like the spy route and thinking, well, like, yeah, there is that too. You know, yeah. Evil overlord uh, boardrooms where they have these bugs yeah. flying in and getting, or you had the little, the little fly on the wall. Mm-hmm. That's kind of walking. I actually, uh, the chat, the chat room brings up a good point. It would be, you couldn't, you wouldn't still have the ability to program them to tell them where to go. No. So you're kind of at the mercenary of where the stupid bug's going to fly. Yeah. That's why you don't want to put it on flies. Otherwise you'll just see what's outside of a window really close up, far away, really close up, far away. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the little camera will just get like a little crack in it's, in it's little, uh, lens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, it brings a whole new meaning to swatting flies. I, I, yeah. I, I never thought about it, uh, but uh, is this actually something that's shipping? Uh, it's, they've, they have had, they've been able to get the energy, test. like I said, from the beetle. So yeah. most of these are, I think so far it's from these kind of beetles that have these hard shells that kind of flap a little bit. Um, but I think they have had little, you know, tiny wings that have been able to get energy off of these. They're hoping to be able to conduct um, their first like real test flights um, soon ish sometime in the next year or so but it all really depends well uh hmm, that's pretty interesting that is pretty interesting i uh bug mercenaries yeah i mean think about it it's gonna be a whole new uh bug job economy opening up now this could, this could be big for the bugs yeah so now you know when you're gonna have your little spy beating you take a can of raid and you you know toss it in and spray it for a little while, then you walk in and then you like, you know, go for electronics. Right. I like that. I like that. And uh, yeah, yeah. Bug killing to whole, a whole, has a whole new meaning. Uh, yeah. Anything else on this story? No, that, that's creepily enough. It is definitely. It is definitely. Now you've got a story that uh, seems like good news for somebody like me who has never managed to pull off the coordination to ride anything as complicated as a unicycle. I mean, one yeah. tire, it just can't be done. No. I think I, I, if I was in the presence of one, I'd like break a leg just being standing next to it. I, uh, I'm not ashamed. Well, I am ashamed, but it is true to admit that uh, unicycles were present in my PE classes in elementary school. And um, oh my, they scared the hell out of me. Yeah. They, uh, you know, just to me, it does not look like a contraption man is meant to ride. Yeah. But there is an, a, a young uh, enterprising uh, entrepreneur out there who's uh, attempting to make them maybe a little more new, newbie friendly, isn't there? Yeah. Now, this is not the first time a self-balancing unicycle has been made. Sure, sure. One of the more famous ones is the Trevor Blackwell's, the unicycle. Right. I think it is. But I like looked at some video in that. There's some, is it the video of the show notes? And it's like a real, uni- like very unicycle-ish. So it's like really tall. So I'd like I, to get on it. I think I'd like be getting on a one-legged horse. You know, I'd need like a ladder and like a wall <laughs> and a crash helmet and an ambulance standing by for, you know, when I break all my right. bones. Right. <laughs> this one, however, it is more segue-ish. So it's kind of smaller. I think I'd have a chance to actually, you know, get on it without breaking the leg, let alone ride it. Yeah, it does look like it would be easier to get up on. That's a good point. Yeah. And it is much uh, 
cheaper than oh. the the tall one. Okay. okay. That the guy's running around in the uh, parking lot on. So this one's, the new one is cheaper. It's electric. Mm-hmm. So, and it has some sort of self-stabilizing gyros that go left and right. Uh, of course, I mean, uh, forward and back. Oh, okay. So you're not falling forward and you're not, fall, you know, falling off backwards. Of course, left to right, it's not all that tall. So you just kind of stop yourself with a foot. Yeah, not much, um, uh, much less distance to fall. So you yeah. could just put a foot out. I like that. Yeah, and it is very segue-ish. You kind of lean forward to go, lean back to stop. Hmm. This guy actually uses it. He's an MIT student. And he actually uses it to, you know, scoot around campus. Yeah, I love this. I, I think I like it better than a, uh, the idea of a Segway. First of yeah. all, you get to sit, and that's yeah. comfortable. Yeah. And uh, it looks faster. And, well... It can go to 15 miles an hour. Okay, so you could almost, like, commute around a city. Uh, yeah, it can go five miles-ish before it needs a recharge right now. So, like, that'd be the perfect thing to take out during lunch, right? You keep this in your office. Mm-hmm. So if you work downtown, you could keep something like this in your office. Why? See, it would. I guess the Segway just didn't have the right price point. But yeah. if you had something that was, say, something that most people could afford, you kept mm-hmm. it at your office, and then you want to go out to lunch, you hop on this stupid thing, and yeah. you ride I mean, out. He carries, yeah, he carries it up and down stairs. It's, you know, it's not as light as a regular unicycle. Right. You know, and yeah. it does take a little bit of uh, a learning curve to get there. Yeah. That's, that makes sense. It's got components and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. And one of the one of the things that you might have seen is, you know, them handing off some sort of box or he's holding a box in one hand. That's sort of a, a dead man switch. Oh. So you, it's like you, you hold it. And once you let go, it stops the motor. It auto stops. It's like the bomb. So as soon as you yeah. drop the bomb, the bomb explodes. Only in this case, as soon it's as you, the unicycle stops. Yeah. Now, the, the, there is some trick in that because sometimes when you fall, you grip Oh, right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like you the, like uh, grasp oh, no, your oh, thumbs no. and grasp your fists and ah. yeah, 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 that's true. I, so, I do that. Yeah. And there's a lot of uh, more details about the PID loops and things like that um, in the show notes and you, a link to his website and yeah. things like that. Yeah. And some pretty pictures and things like that. Now he's got like a little computer on there on, on this one of these pictures you have in here. Yeah. That's part of the, um, the processor that sort of keeps the gyros going for, for forward and back. And sort of keeps everything in track and what it's doing. Oh, that's kind of neat. This looks like some real hardware. And if, and if he's getting five hours, yeah, of of, of, of or I'm sorry, five miles of yeah. travel. That's not bad, even with all that equipment on there. Yeah, he's got. It's running on uh, two uh, seven H H twelve volt batteries. Um, there's some. Bridges, microcontrollers, various things. Like I said, there there's some more details in the in the sh- in the show notes. Okay. I'd be afraid that I'd really mess that up if I wasn't paying attention to it. <laughs> the details there. Yeah. Um. It is. But all- yeah, like like you said, there like you saw there were some things there, and he he talks about what it is. The programming is in public domain. Oh wow! So, so like made, open source. Made, yeah, it's you know written in C. And then just put it out for everyone to see. Sort of talks about it enough that he even admits it on his webpage. He's like, yeah, if you were, you know, an engineer in kind of new circuits, then you could pretty much copy exactly what I've done. Just you have to make the, the hard, like the, the building, the, you know. So you're telling me this is an open source unicycle? Yes. That's amazing. That's yeah. the best unicycle in the world right there. <laughs> yep. That's why I put it in there because I knew you like that. <laughs> I'm like, like just that. smiling, clapping glee uh, over there. Oh, I just, it just does bring a big smile to my face because I know it's the new generation or whatever. And I just, I love it. I just, yeah. I love the, the, the first unicycle that we mentioned earlier, I believe his, uh, his, his programming was open source too, or public domain. Okay. Okay. So a lot, a lot of these, these new younger, um, you're, what you're you saying know, is right. there's a, there's a hot, hot competition in the unicycle software platform space. And so <laughs> because of this competition, they're forced to open source their platforms. Of course. Sort of like Google open sourced Android to make sure that uh, platform adoption would take place across a, a large range of unicycles. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you want everyone, you know, scooting around the city in unicycles because obviously they want to. Right. Yeah. Just like segues. Just like segues. Yeah, it totally will catch on. <laughs> I mean, nothing can go wrong in a unicycle. Right. Right. Uh, even a self-balancing one. What could go wrong? Yeah. Do you want to talk a little uh, Lovejoy? Yes. Okay. Now, this, if I recall, now tell me if I'm right, mm-hmm. uh, is the comet that uh, shot around the sun and everyone expected to burn up, but yep. then was pleasantly surprised when uh, we actually saw it come back around, right? Yep. This is the little comet who could. Yeah. Uh, right now, uh, 
our friends down in Australia, uh, mostly, and in the Southern Hemisphere, are getting a nice show with this thing. There's a, you know, a five hour and 30 seconds, you know, video. There's some, the space station was able to take some images and some video of oh, it. Oh, God, just gorgeous, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, my so, gosh. There's just been some photo- photography from the space station, from Australia. You know, and this is, it's kind of interesting because this will probably be the last time and maybe the last time we ever see this comet or anyone's able to ever see this comet. You don't think it, it kind of take anymore kind of a thing? Um, it's going to burn well, up? A lot, no, it's not that. It's a lot of these comets just sort of shoot in around the sun and then just go out and nothing stops them. Oh, They just I go see. forever. Now, I some see. of them have, them or have orbits that are just thousands and thousands and thousands of years long. You know, we think, you know, one of the biggest famous comet is, uh, you know, Com- Halley's Comet. Hail, oh, yeah. Or is it a hail, is it hail bop uh, Is that a different comet or is that the same comet? A uh, different comet. Okay. Halley's Comet is the one that, you know, has the 75, 76 year, you oh, know, every, sure, every sure, time it sure. shows back up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, there are other ones that, you know, have been famous because they come by and they're really bright or they have longer periods, you know, so it's every couple hundred years or things like that, that it comes back around. But. Because of, you know, Comet, Halley's Comet, you kind of think, you know, these, they have nice little orbits, but it's very much the oddball of comets. So many of these just sort of Fly come out. in, whoosh, huh. and they're off into the universe. I didn't realize. That's kind of sad because they're so, they're so cool and, and so impressive looking that we only get yeah. to see them for such a short period of time. Well, essentially, this guy just kind of surprised everybody by surviving at all, so... He's having a nice little life now. That's we expected true. the sun to eat him, and That's he managed true. to scurry away. He is sort of hanging out on borrowed time, maybe slightly yeah. overstaying his original welcome. I see, yep. I see what you're saying. Um, well, that's pretty neat. Uh, I, there, there's nothing that on this side of the planet that we get to see, though, right? It's all for the Aussies at this point. Yeah, it's all, all for the, the Aussies. They get, they get all the cool stuff this time. Mm, that's, that's we had a little bit of a view from it uh, at one time, and we, got, you know, we have the, the images that we can see that the space station and that our Aussie friends share with us. but. Mm-hmm. Nice of them to do so as well. I know. Uh, do you want to change gears for a second, or is there anything else you want to cover on that one? No, we can change gears. All right, let's change gears. And uh, uh, this, I might get a little soapboxy here, but okay. uh, you raised an interesting topic in the show notes, and uh, yes. I, I want to give you a chance to expand upon it. But uh, you're calling it a dose of science reality, and I, th- I, I think you're kind of going after uh, sort of cheap, fast-paced uh, publications and things like that. Am I, am I following you correctly here? What's going on? Yeah. Share me. That, share that with is, your share your thoughts with me, Heather. Well, this was, was actually uh, in the Psychological Science Journal. Is that there are some scientific fields? I'm not saying that this happens everywhere or all the time, but there are some fields and some journals that are they're seeing a trend towards shorter, faster, more frequent publications. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, there's some very, very obvious reasons why this would happen. Um, I mean, sometimes a short publication is needed. You know, you just have concise, it's a small thing, it's, you know, wham, bam, it's done. Okay. You know, so there are some instances where you don't need to go on for 300 pages on something. Well, would you not consider SciBite maybe a short sort of version of that? Um, to some degree. The problem is that these kind of papers are... are so they're the source, right? Where they're we're, the source. We're reporting, they are, right. Yeah, they are what's gathering the data. Right, right. You know, you have to gather data in order to get a, an idea. Correct. You get and the so we're thing. kind of, I kind of think Cybite's more the combating that. Because what this is doing is that you increase um, the probability that you, you're taking a bit of... You're you, increasing... The, well, you're, you're, when you have to publish at a yeah. certain pace, yeah. I would think you're taking a risk that there's going to be details you miss, or yeah. um, maybe False more important lines. is uh, verification. Yeah, there's no, there's not enough time for you know verification or people kind of looking at each other's stuff, and some of this is because you want to be cited more for your name to get out there. That's how you you become more famous as you have a lot of citations. So you want your name to be on as many papers as you can. Sure. So it's sort of, you know, a win for you if you split, you know, your one paper into five. Then your name appears five times. That's true. So it's kind of like uh, bloggers who try to syndicate themselves across multiple blogs. 
That way they become known and then they become kind of like a hot commodity. Yeah. What about, what about, uh, I, I honestly, when I started thinking about this, when I saw you throw this in there, I was thinking this seems kind of like um, more traditional media outlets response to the internet. Yeah. In the sense that the internet is just so, uh, you know, if you, if 24 hours go by on the internet, it's like a week in traditional media time. Um, yeah. And so I wonder if they just feel like they're trying to compete with the different audience now. Sort of. I mean, that it's sort of reverse engineering this problem. I mean, the major media outlets get these, you know, hot topic items sometimes from these really short papers that have, maybe they don't have the statistical average, or maybe you got some deviation in results, you know, that you, if you did it over six months, then that deviation would be, oh, that's just, that's just something weird that happened those, those couple of weeks. But if you only focus on that, then you get some big, you know, major headline. Now, the journals kind of enjoy this too, because I mean, they're competing each other. Okay, sure, sure. So, why wouldn't it make sense for an editor to go, wow, that's really surprising data. Let's put that on the cover. That'll help sell to, I mean, right. you're selling to the science community, but well, and this won't people, always happen. And but, it'll get people linking to our site, print, print yeah. edition or not. Obviously, that won't good. always happen, but it's going to happen sometimes for some of these editors. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so then some surprising bit of information comes, you know, the science news staff on some media, you know, for the, some of these major media conglomerates, you know, see some something it pops up there and suddenly the entire world is being shaken it's a brand new news alert right well i you kind know, of i kind of think back to the on again off again situation we had with the faster than light finding from yes. the uh, lhc right yeah well to some degree yeah that that's where it is you know so it's if you if you say something every every month then it's changing i mean that's kind of a it keeps people interested but at a certain point people are starting to tune you out well, you get like a, a famous one that I always hear is, uh, well, everything causes cancer. So I just give up because yeah, uh, that's a great example of science discovers something. And then it's an evolving process of continuing yeah. to test, continuing to research and test in different scenarios and then updating yeah. those results. But when the publication runs, drinking two cups of coffee will prevent uh, colon cancer. Then, uh, you know, that's a great headline. Right. Yeah. And so you run with that. But the problem is, and honestly, uh, we make no bones about it. It's one of the reasons we set up SciBite is there's never any follow up. And it, yeah. See, what I think you're up against is this is just the flavor du jour that the Internet's going to bring us with news. I mean, this is just yeah. how news is going to be. And it's going to become it's going to become up to uh, news outlets to process the news and then follow up on the news and continue to update people. Yeah. There's almost so much information that you need information curators now that are trusted sources to yeah. properly curate it. Yeah, and so that's kind of the issue is that everything with the, with the internet being so instantaneous, everyone wants, you know, right, right, snap, right. snap, snap, snap now. Mm -hmm. You know, it, so that sort of idea in that culture is, is sort of invading a lot of different places. Um, not everywhere, obviously, and there's, some, there's a lot of the science community that's, you know, taking their time and doing the research. Sure. But, I mean, for any of the stories I bring up, I... I look at a couple different, a couple different locations and sources to kind of see what are they saying? What are they saying? Mm -hmm. Huh? They're saying two different things. Let's not say anything about that. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, there's been things we've excluded from the show because of that. Yeah. I mean, there's been, you know, I get, there's a lot of articles going up on some of these pages. Some of these sites that I go to look completely different if you go back four hours from now. Because they're just saying every little, you know, something that comes along. Right. Right. So there's a couple of sites that, you know, pick up some big things and anything that looks interesting to me, then I, I scurry about on the internet looking, you know, at the sites I trust and kind of pulling it all together. You know, and so that's kind of what you need. It's, it takes more work and it's not quite so instantaneous, but working a little bit harder and kind of looking at all this stuff and gathering it together is sort of more what gives you a better idea of. Yeah. what an issue is about. Oh, oh, absolutely. But do, I just don't think what you are seeing has a very likely, very large chance of changing because it's, um, it's, it's easier from their standpoint to do more frequent, shorter content. It saves them time. It gets yeah. them bet more traffic and uh, they produce more content that way. Yeah. As far as... It's not great, but I just don't see yeah, them having any Yeah, as far as major media goes, yeah, I don't see that changing. I... I'd like to think that the scientific community, um, sometimes it'll kind of swing one way, but like a pendulum will sort of overcorrect this way and sure. then kind of settle down. So I'd like to kind of think that it'll, you know, there'll be 
something will happen. There'll be an uproar and then everyone will, will grouse at each other as, as the scientific community does. And then it'll sort of swing the other way and then kind of come back to some sort of middle ground. Yeah. That makes you know, sense. I'd like to think that it'll kind of, you know, like a crazy bit of data, it'll sort of average out in the end. I'd like to think that. Well, uh, I think you have you have two possible ways I could see that shaking out. I mean, you have yeah. um, the scientific community could just come together and say, we're going to take a standardized approach to releasing discoveries. Something, yeah. you know, and maybe each different scientific industry would sort of come up with whatever is appropriate for them. I, or each I, journal would. Sure. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I just don't really see the journals doing it because it just seems like there's so much incentive for them not to in terms of, of economic incentives. Um, but, uh, the other thing is, um, how people get the news, what you might start having is eventually the public realizes what's going on and starts just being more self-selective about where they get their news Mm -hmm. from. Well, for some of these journals, I mean, not many people are subscribing to uh, psychological daily or, you know, Mm -hmm. astronomical, you know, the astronomy. They're trying to grab headlines probably to get, well, yeah, they might be trying to grab headlines, but a lot of this is to just the scientific community. So. You can establish yourself as a journal that only does this. These are our rules. Nothing will get past this. And so then people yeah. will see that and then you'll, they'll say, this is a trusted source. You know, this is, right. this, that kind of thing is how you become a trusted source. And then people will be more likely to say, we'll take this one definitely. And then we'll kind of bounce between these others. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that may be something where, you know, we take a firm stand on this. And then other journals say, oh, they're, they're doing well. Maybe we should, maybe we should say we're going to do the same thing and actually do it. Right. So market forces basically make them do it. Yeah. I could see that. I, I, so some sort of supply and demand would say, no, 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 no. We demand that you actually have a lot of data that's been cross-checked, you know, that you don't just foo-foo this. You know, yes, it's, it, it gets us, you know, a flash in the pan. Everyone looks at us for 15 minutes. And then when we go back and say, yeah, that that really wasn't true. Then the next time you have something big, the public doesn't think much of it. Yeah. Well, they're like, you know, it's um one of the classics in scientific community is uh, cold fusion. You know, they came out and said, "We have cold fusion, everybody," and then they couldn't necessarily, yeah, right. you know, they couldn't repeat it. Nobody else could repeat it, and then it's sort of now you're a laughing stock. Yeah, it's a joke now. Now you're a joke. Yep. Mm, a good good point. So um, even if something is way awesome, you know, I've had results in our lab and it's like, huh. You know, sometimes it's, yeah, that's impossibly good. Right. Or sometimes Too it's. Too good to be true. Well, completely, you know, science breaks. It's like something's got to be wrong here because it, it's, there's, there's no way you can get seven um, flowers out of two going in. Oh, yeah, you uh, get, subspace. You just got to factor in uh, a subspace well, anomaly. Yeah, that's that's subspace, but I can't really publish subspace experiment results. okay if you say so well you know not in the, any of the places we want to go <laughs> but there are also some times where it's like 100 percent efficiency mm, don't think so let's shake everything out mm-hmm, mm-hmm. more believe something a little lower than that so yeah. you can't you know look you relook at stuff and obviously not everything's that obvious but you know there is there is that that give and take where you want publications under your name you know as many of them as you can get and you want, you know, your awesome results to get out there as quickly as you can. Right. And sometimes, you know, you might have some like funding on the line. You got to create some buzz, yeah. get some people You've interested and put more money. You've got funding, yeah. you know, and they, they want results and they want you to publish so that their stuff can be awesome and, pe- and money comes coming in. And right. There's a lot of pull and take on this stuff. And it, it's just an issue to, that everyone kind of has to look at and think about. And like everything else, you can't just. If something looks really surprising, it, it is skeptical. Science is skeptical. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, that's that's. Uh, I mean, that's that makes you great for the show. I think a lot of people um, aren't even really exposed to it at the level you are because you do so much yeah. research for your day job and for the show. But uh, yeah, um, I'm glad and that me, I'm glad you know that you're I've, I've jumped on bandwagons on the show before. Where I'm later, I'm like, yeah, I spoke too soon. You I think? foofed that, or I jumped on that bandwagon, and now do you have an Do you have an example in mind? I can't think of anything. Uh, it was the faster than light neutrinos. 
Oh, well, you jumped on the skeptical bandwagon. I jumped on skeptical really Well, I mean, come on. If you're going to jump on a bandwagon. This this and this and this are just obviously going to be major problems in it. And I wonder if they did that. And I even got, you know, some feedback going, come on. They obviously thought about that. You know, I have people, know, people that work in that field. And that's kind of rude of you saying that. Okay. Well, like, oh, yeah, I guess I was a little too skeptical and I was, you know, any mindset, even if you think that's impossible, you know, so any results that show that it might be possible, you know, it's, you kind of have to temper everything and like, look at it, yeah. see it and then kind of pull back and right. like, well, let's see what happens over the next period of time. Well, and what'd you do? I mean, later on, we covered it on the show and you updated and said, you know, uh, further evidence has been revealed. And honestly, yeah. I mean, as soon as the further evidence that came along that uh, backed up the original findings, yeah, it's not like you were like, oh, well, that's, I mean, that's impossible. I mean, oh, you were okay. like, okay, well, that makes sense. I can see that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not so bad. Yeah. It's a good It's a good topic. Is there any, any other thoughts you have on it before we move on? No, I just thought it was a really good topic for us. Yeah. It really fit the Cybite whole mentality. I totally agree. I totally agree. Well, uh, why don't we uh, move along and talk a little bit about a Russian spacecraft. Yes, our poor little Russian spacecraft that couldn't. Is Phobos this, grunt. This is the uh, this is the Russian probe that was supposed to go to Mars, but didn't end up making it out of orbit of Earth. Yeah, it was supposed to go to one of Mars's moons, pick up a little scoop of dirt, and come back. Oh, it was going to be so cool. I was really looking that forward to it. Talk cool. about it on the show. Yeah, that would have been amazing. Unfortunately, as we've said before, we've covered it on a couple different side bites now. It had some sort of issue, and it's been stuck in low Earth orbit. And they've. they've projected- uh, they haven't been able to like uh, open up like uh, any kind of repairs remotely or anything like that, right? No, they they briefly had some communication with it. I believe it was in one of the um, in one of the Australian uh, dishes that were able to speak to it very briefly, or mm-hmm. some maybe something in Europe. I don't recall off the top of my head. One of the two of them. Um, I think they were able to contact successfully. And then it kind of went silent. And they were able to weren't able to contact anymore. There's been a couple of um, amateur astronomers that have been able to snag pictures of it oh. as it goes overhead. So they know so it's still up there. Yeah, they're, it's still up there. Oh, obviously you can track it. Mm-hmm. Um, you can see something as they're orbiting. You just can't talk to it. Mm-hmm. And then kind of take pictures of it and see, you know, it's pretty much black and white, but you can kind of see the shape of it. You know, there's, it's lit here and there and there's shadow there. And you kind of take a picture of the satellite and rotate it and be like, oh, that's how it's orbiting right there. So they're thinking that's probably going to re-enter the atmosphere sometime this month. Um, earlier today, they put out an estimate that says they're pretty sure it's going to come down on the 15th. Okay. Hmm. Now, there are pieces that will survive, including one of the uh, planetary societies. You know, they put up some a hockey disc that had some various microorganisms and stuff to see how life would exist, you know, outside the earth's radiation you know on the way to mars and come back well it's been in low earth orbit but they'd still like to see what it did now um, it can I interrupt for a second yeah that radiation belt that they're worried about on the trip to mars mm-hmm. shouldn't that be the same radiation belt that we've already traversed on several occasions to get to the moon uh somewhat i just don't understand like uh where's the confusion i thought we've already mastered that radiation belt Sort of. I mean, passing through it, yeah, that's, it's getting out past its protection. So the moon is kind of, I don't recall how far out it goes, but the moon kind of has something there. and It's kind of close enough. Well, that, like its own magnetic field kind of. Yeah, kind of. Well, I mean, you're going to land on the, the near side of the moon. Mm-hmm. So you're going to be kind of facing the earth at all times. So it won't be that, that bad. And they were only there for a few days. Yeah, yeah. Actually, and you know what? Right that's back. a good. In fact, that's a good point. I believe. Um, actually, now that now that I think about it, if I recall back, uh, it was something like um, they got a year's worth of exposure that a typical nuclear plant employee would get, and so a, a nuclear employee plant, the amount of exposed exposure to radiation they'd have in a year mm-hmm. was essentially how much the Apollo astronauts got when they traveled through, and it was something like. 36 or or 33 of the 39 Apollo astronauts that traveled total with all the Apollo missions that traveled through or uh-huh. that have traveled through that belt have developed cataracts like something like 30 out of 36 or something like that. It's yeah. a ton of them and they believe it's from their exposure to that belt. It do, it could be. Hmm. So they still have they still have that as a as a hump they have to get over to go to Mars, huh? Yeah, well, you know, and then 
yeah, I mean, you're going to be in space at, at a minimal of six months just getting to Mars, just kind of chilling in space. Right, without the protection of the atmosphere and all those kinds of nice things. Without the protection of the magnetic, you know, Van Allen belt kind of protecting us from radiation. Mm-hmm. Mar- Mars doesn't have much of that either. So it's just kind of a seeing, you know, what would it do to this kind of stuff? Right. Now it's been in low Earth orbit for a while, but, and it would survive reentry. But as we all know, with, when we ever talk about these things, the Earth is two thirds water. Very likely it'll fall in water. Kind of likely no one will ever see it come down. That we'll just kind of track it coming down. No one will actually snag a picture. Hmm. That's kind of a whimper. It kind of goes out on a whimper. Yeah, It was going to be a glorious mission to Mars, getting Mars dirt, and instead, it's going to silently crash into the water. Yeah. I hope they do another one. I really hope the Russians aren't discouraged. I hope they launch another one, because... I know they've, they've had a string of bad luck. Exactly. And I think even the, uh, the Russian government has kind of glared at you know, the space agency engineers and scientific community and kind of glared at them fairly hard. And I think they're probably going to, they might take a step back and kind of reanalyze some of these engines or various pieces and parts. Hmm. You know, it's because you, you don't want to prob- have, they probably should, to be honest. Yeah. You don't want to have too many failures. One, because money and two, because then everyone's kind of looking at you and going, yeah, yeah you made another failure. Psh, that's not news. You kind of become the joke. That's, yeah. You don't want that either. No. Yeah. So. But like you said, I hope they go back to the drawing board, maybe find some of the problems they've had, but yep. move forward because uh, I need, we, need, we need more people kicking the Amer- Americans' ass into gear to, to do our Yeah, I mean, the more... Good old know, space more, race. Yeah, the more these you know, major countries or private industry or whatever this is, but the more everybody works, the more when somebody sees something working or not working, everyone else goes, all right, and everyone can learn from it. And then the next person who has this weird, funky idea of, you know, Say, seeing that sees that and goes hey i wonder if we did this and then they try it and it, if it works and everyone else goes wow glorious idea and then everybody, everybody uses that right right yeah uh interesting interesting stuff and also links in the show notes to the previous episodes of Cybite where we've talked about uh, phobos and it's, yep. it's and uh and honestly it's kind of fun uh, if you start at Cybite 20 I think yeah. that's the episode where we talk about, oh my gosh, it's going to be it's so great. It's about to launch. Yeah. <laughs> then, it's exciting. And then it just kind of goes downhill. But you can, you can actually listen to the train wreck uh, if you listen to Cybite 20, 21, and 23. And we have links to those in yep. the show. And notes. there's also animations of uh, what they think will happen as it comes to enters the, the atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, anything else on that story? Nope. That pretty much covers our, our sad little. Well, I, no, that's good. That's good because I just got I just got the time machine out here, Heather. So we're going to. That's right. We're jumping in the time machine. We're going to go back in time and uh, find out what happened this week on the science calendar. So uh, our first one takes us to January sixth, seventh, and the eighth from this week, uh, eighteen fifty one, a hundred and sixty years ago. What happened? That is right. Scientists for a long time have been trying to measure how fast the earth was rotating. You know, they'd try to climb up really high heights and drop something and see it moved over two inches. That's just exactly how far the earth rotated in that time. Ah. The problem is that it just happened too fast. Either it wasn't a high enough height. It just happened too fast. There'd be complications. They couldn't really get an accurate reading on this. Oh, well, you know, that happens. Yeah. So it was man, uh, Foucault, who actually started in a completely different field of science. You know, decided, uh, believe the medical science. Fear blood, couldn't take it, backed out, did a lot of self study. <laughs> Who gets into the medical practice and has a fear of blood? <laughs> family pressure. Family pressure, okay. Family pressure says go into this. <laughs> so you go into that and you, you just figured, found that it just totally didn't work for him. So he did a lot of self research. He did a lot of internships and work and labs and kind of under, you know, as an underling and kind of looking and analyzing and everything. And he kind of got this idea. He suddenly got this idea. And so he worked for weeks in his cellar with an 11 pound pendulum hanging from a six and a half foot cable. And he sort of hung it from the top of his cellar and let it swing back and forth. Oh. And there was this small clockwise motion in how, you know, it, it would swing. To a point here and a point there. And then if it came back, it would be slightly in a clockwise position. Yeah, yeah, and sure. It started moving. And so he thought about it. And 
what it was is the pendulum is still growing straight. It's the earth that's moving. Ah, uh, that had, is pretty trippy to think about, isn't it? Yeah, and so he'd figure out geometric ways to account for your latitude. You know, at different various latitudes, it would be measuring different things. He right. demonstrated it for Napoleon in 1851. Oh. Later that year. You know, some people may have seen these kind of, you know, things in uh, museums. I've seen it in a few where it's this, you know, they have a high, high atrium and there's a long pole and this big pendulum swings back and forth. And sometimes they'll have it on sand and it'll kind of scrape yep. the sand in circles. Yep, yep. And so that, that's what that is. It's showing that's the rotation of the earth. And that's how this guy just figured it out. 160 years ago. That's awesome. Well, and uh, that's not to take away from 43 years ago, January 10th, 1968. Put your moon boots back on because robots are invading the moon. Yes, this is a moon-tastic episode. It is. This is a, all kinds of mooning in this episode. I know. <laughs> well, let, let's not make you moon on the, on the street. No, that's right, okay. right, right. <laughs> all right, so what happened uh, 43 years ago? Surveyor 7 marked the end of a string of American uh, unmanned exploration satellites, you know, little rovers and not rovers, but they'd landed on the moon and kind of look around. And they did a whole bunch of these, a series of these kind of looking at the, looking at the moon, checking out the, the surface, kind of getting a better idea of what was going to happen to their Apollo astronauts. And after this one, it was Apollo. Oh, okay. So this was, uh, I didn't know we, okay. It's funny. I didn't realize that we had uh, the capability to have robots back then. Yeah. Well, it wasn't like robots per se. It was just sort of, uh, you land, uh, a stationary object. It was able to take, uh, TV pictures after landing. It could do some chemical analysis sort of, you know, I suppose at that stage in the game, just some great landscape photography would be incredibly valuable for them before they land on there. Oh, yeah. And they were actually, you know, able to take, um, they will take a total of like over 21,000 pictures were transmitted to Earth. And there was like over 20,000 TV camera pictures. Wow. How Just in the first day. You know, it, uh, it, uh, it reminds me of um, what it must have felt like. What it must have felt like for them was what it felt like for me when the Mars rovers first landed. Yeah. All of the pictures we first got back and all that kind of stuff. I, I just, I remember all of it. Oh, yeah. Uh, any other ones on that one? Uh, just that the, all of these series were, all, were, la- were landed in the Lunar Highlands region, which is where all our astronauts went to. Right. Makes sense, right? So it was, it was all preparatory work for them. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, speaking of the Martian landers, uh, yes. Spirit Rover, seven years ago, January 4th, 2004, right? This wow. is the launch, yeah? Was this the launch what? or is this the landing? This is the landing. Okay. They actually landed it. I remember that. I See, this is what I was just talking about. Oh, boy, do I remember. This was so oh, yeah. exciting. Oh, incredibly exciting. Yeah, I, This I was the first of the two. There were, you know, we've had, we've had, we had two of these little rover guys, Spirit and Opportunity. Yep, yep. Spirit landed the first. So it, it did the bounce landing, you know, mm-hmm. it had all the balloons, big bouncy house surrounding it. It bounced around and kind of opened up. A little rover crawled out. Yeah, I remember the bouncy thing and, and uh, how, uh, how crazy that seemed and uh, how, how flawlessly it worked and how amazed by that I was. Oh, yeah. It was amazingly cool. And it was just such a simple, straightforward, this is how it's going to happen. And yeah. as long as the, the, the balloons inflated and deflated, I, you know. I also seem to recall that that was the first time, at least that, again, from my recollection, uh-huh. that NASA heavily publicized like 3D renderings of uh, what was going to happen, like in press events and things like that. And I so, believe so. And yeah, then again. yeah. So even before, even before, as the public, we all got to see what it was supposedly going to look like. And, yeah, uh, yeah. That, I mean, you can't really, you know, if there's no camera there, you can't watch it happen. Right. You know, so you want to have something showing to the public. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I think we're just about all done with the time machine. You want to uh, look up into the sky? Sure. All right. So uh, what do we have up in the sky this week? Well, some people may have been able to see the quadranted. I know I didn't spell that, mispronounced that. It was a meteor shower. Very brief, kind of eye-catching. You still might be able to, to see it a night or two um, after you hear this, the podcast or when it's published. 
but it is a very short one. It pretty much has a, a couple hour window for its, its greatest moment. You know, these, these meteor showers are, you know, when the earth kind of passes through a comet trail. Right. You only get a limited time. Yes. So many of them last a couple days. This particular one is just, it's not a whole lot. It's a brief, brief window. Then you can, you see it for, it's a pretty good meteor shower. It just lasts a very short time. Okay. Okay. That sounds exciting. Anything else? Yep. Uh, Wednesday, the day this episode is being filmed, the earth is its, its closest point to the sun for the year. Wow, really? Boy, it doesn't feel like it. everybody in the chat room is talking about how cold it is. <laughs> yes. It's not hot here. It's either. all in your mind, chat room. We're the closest yep. to the sun we're going to be all year, so get over it. <laughs> Bunch of babies. Yeah. Well, this week, on um, Saturday, there'll be a couple of bright objects near the moon. Unfortunately, this time, they are not planets. Oh, okay. A couple of bright uh, stars, Aldebaran, Betelgeuse, Castor and Pollux. Betelgeuse is a favorite. Of- Yep. Okay. And uh, Monday the 9th is a full moon. Oh, cool. Okay. So Monday the 9th. There you go. Yep. Full moon happening. And actually, after popular demand, I have a couple of things for our Southern Hemisphere listeners. Oh. I finally found a couple of sites that I found I could kind of rely on and had some good information. So I can uh, publish a couple things for our Aussie friends and everyone on the other side of the uh, equator. All right, let's do it. We should say, too, if people, if you want to send in questions or show suggestions, you can email them to scibite at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Yes. So uh, what's happening down south in the southern region? In the southern regions. On the 5th, the almost full moon will be sitting next to a star cluster, Pleiades. You can see six or seven stars in that. What makes Pleiades interesting is in ancient times, in order to pick archers for a military, they would have you look at this star cluster and say, count the stars. And everyone would be like, uh, five? Okay, you're, <laughs> you're the swing sword and board type. Get over there. So you look at it be like, I see eight. Yep, you're an archer. Here you go. It, would be, it was like an eye test to see oh. who had the sharpest eyes. And then they, they would be the archers because they would be able to see the furthest and be the most, have the chance to be the most accurate. That's really interesting. So, uh, I, yeah, because before they had like the index card or whatever you call it now, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, that's cool. Uh, what else is happening? Anything else happening down there for those, for those, for those blokes? Well, the reddish looking star above the moon on the 6th, not Mars this time. It is a star called Aldebaran. Okay. I've got a couple of notes about when Venus, Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn are all kind of rising and setting the first part of this month. And then, uh, in general, links to all the kind of websites that you can get up to the minute data or, you know, where satellites are and all sorts of crazy information about that. Yep. Always towards the bottom of the show notes over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. You can find the links to the stuff in your area. Yep. But uh, that's cool that people sent in asking for the Southern Hemisphere. So you worked it in there. I like that. Mm-hmm. We actually have a lot of people listening all over the world. So it makes sense, right? Yeah. Well, Heather, I think that just about brings us to the end of this episode of SciBite. I think so. Well, okay, everyone, here's the details. SciBite is live over jblive.tv at 7.30 p.m. Pacific, and uh, that's on Tuesdays at jblive.tv, and then we release Wednesday morning. Uh, actually, I put them up really late Tuesday night, my time, so that's Pacific, so probably for most of the world, it's, it's, up, it's up. Anytime you wake up Wednesday morning, you should be able to find every episode of SciBite over jupiterbroadcasting.com, and of course, why well, you could always just subscribe to an RSS feed, and then you wouldn't have to worry about when we release, right? Late yeah. or not, you would just automatically get it. All right, Heather, well, thanks for a great show. Thank you. All right, everyone, well, thanks for listening to this week's episode, and we'll see you right back here next week. 